my fellow hunters. This is Rick Crawford with the Wildlife Hour. Today the topic I've chosen to talk about is archery mule deer hunting techniques. Um, with, with a lot of different hunting there's pretty much one method of, of being successful and mule deer hunting is a little bit different. I think unlike whitetails, which are mostly hunted from blinds or stands, there are several techniques that can be used to successfully take mule deer. Because of the uh, variety of habitats that mule deer live in here in the West, and there's also a couple of different methods that can be used successfully to harvest mule deer. There's actually three different techniques that I have used successfully to kill mule deer bucks. Um, the first one I want to touch on is a lesser known method of mule deer hunting that has worked well for certain individuals. Um, I have had some limited success with it and I think maybe because I just don't have the patience to to hunt this way. It's just I've had a couple of successful hunts and this is called still hunting. And with still hunting what what you're doing is you're slowly moving through the woods during the period of time when mule deer are actively feeding during the morning and the evening or when the the uh, hunting fishing times show a good period of time for animal activity. One of these periods of time could be just before a storm or just after a storm. But as I was saying, you, you work slowly through the woods, getting the wind in your face, and you're moving very, very slowly, taking a step, maybe two or three steps, stopping for several minutes, glassing, looking around for any movement, um, anything that could, watching the areas where mule deer like, the feed types that they're, they're, they're feeding on, and just slowly working your way along with the wind through the woods. This is usually done in thicker habitat where um, spotting and stalking from a distance away is not very effective. Um, I caution you not to try this during the period of time when mule deer are bedded down because they're going to be low to the ground, they're going to be still, they're going to be blended in, and nine out of ten times the mule deer is going to see you before or wind you before you see them see it. And so um, spotting and stalking for that really patient individual that likes to get in there and just work his way through the woods during the period of time when the mule deer are up feeding and moving to water, it can be an effective um, technique. I prefer, if I'm going to hunt in the heavy, heavier, thicker woods, I prefer to use more of the technique used for whitetail hunting. Uh, using tree stands and ground blinds. And I believe overall this is a more effective technique for most people. You are, you put yourself in a location between the bedding and feeding areas and the mule deer are moving to you. And so you can see, see them approaching. You're in an elevated or in a covered blind position your scent is, if you've set your stands up right, your scent is blowing away from the deer uh, over its head or you're in a blind and, and you, you've got it in the same situation where you've got the wind direction in your benefit. You've also got the ability with that blind to block a lot of your scent and with some of the new 
uh, electronics and things on the scene like ozonics you can also effectively block a lot more of your human scent in a, in a blind. Um, I think in the elevated position just like with whitetail hunting being in an elevated position where you can see around is is a very deadly and mule deer in their habitat are not used to looking up into the trees unless they hear a sound and I know in a lot of areas my friends and clients tell me about <laughs> whitetail running around the woods looking up in the trees uh, mule deer just don't do that they they're not hunted a lot this way and for a big mule deer buck if you can get in between their feeding and their bedding areas and set up in an area that they're comfortable in, in semi-heavy cover where there's a nice trail leading to water or to food sources you can have a very deadly setup for big mule deer buck and every year a lot of mule deer a lot more mule deer are being killed this way we've had a lot of success in our hunting operation killing mule deer in this with this method um, I'm going to show you a few video clips in this program of actual of, of an actual harvest of a mule deer from a tree stand situation where the deer was coming down to feed and and to water and um, and then was shot at the water hole as really a nice buck and I'm going to show you that hunt later in this program and so anybody that's familiar with whitetail hunting can apply those same principles to mule deer but before you can apply any of these principles to, to to mule deer you need to know that there's a big mule deer buck in the area you need to focus on particular animals to have success and out here in the west we have a lot of a lot of ground we have a lot of mountains and a lot I mean it, it's a vast area and there can be a lot of areas that doesn't hold very many mule deer and may not hold a big buck and so before you put in a lot of work into a likely area you need to do your scouting and your field work get some trail cameras into the woods glass if you can you need to locate a giant mule deer buck to hunt and then to learn his habits and his patterns without spooking him. The way you can do this and the way, the way I do this is I go into the feeding areas, more of the little open meadows, the little open areas and the watering holes. If you have isolated water, if you're in an area that's, that's a little bit drier and you have some isolated water, then it makes it easier. You can go to those water sources you can put some trail cameras on those water sources and you can see what's there. Um, with using any trail camera with a big buck, I have found that you need to use a blackout, black ops, a non-flash type of trail camera. Even the red glowing infrared light I have seen will spook some of these great big bucks if you get a buck on camera once and you never see him there again then you know you can know that you've spooked that animal particularly if you see a picture of that deer looking at the camera identifying the camera he's alarmed he's alarmed and he leaves the area then you need to get a different camera you need to have different brand cameras and I elk a lot of species of, of game are, are not real spooked of, of trail cameras. But mule deer, especially the bigger bucks, are particularly sensitive to the flash, to the, to the glowing lights and the things that they, they don't, you know, they don't understand and, and they're become alarmed by. And so some of the newer blackout type Cameras, cameras that don't make any sound when they trigger, those are the type of cameras you want to use for scouting for big buck. 
Um, I start with the water and the trails. You look for large, large tracks. You know, big blocky large tracks, three inches plus long and wide. Um, if you can find large tracks in an area around the water, around the feeding sources, then you can set your cameras up there. Some areas allow you to use bait or mineral licks. I don't encourage hunting over bait because mule deer are so unpredictable with bait. It's, they're not like whitetail. They may hit a, a bait source once or twice, but they, they're not very predictable. And I have found that some big mule deer bucks won't ever hit a foreign uh, food source. Um, and so if you, if you are in an area that it's legal to use bait, you can experiment and, uh, you know, apples and corn, things like that, seem to be fairly successful and some people have success with, with some mule deer with those type of things. In the areas that I hunt, we can use mineral licks. And I have found that the mineral licks work great to bring mule deer into an area and to get their, their photographs and to see what's in the area. But as far as hunting over a mineral lick, it's pretty unpredictable. Um, some big bucks will hit the mineral lick every three or four days, once a week, twice a month. Um, once again, it's not, it doesn't seem to be predictable enough to use as an effective hunting technique. I, like, I, I feel like a much better method of setting up for mule deer bucks, particularly these bigger bucks, is to find the areas where they're bedding. If you can find their bedding areas, and, 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 and you got to be careful doing this without spooking the deer out of the area. I encourage people, to, the hunters, to get into the woods early in the spring once the snow's gone and to find these feeding and watering areas and then to carefully locate where they're finding these big big deer beds. And they're usually going to be up in the shadowy areas in the, the canopy of trees. And a mule deer buck, unlike a whitetail, does not like to bed in really thick cover. They don't like really thick cover. And I think one of the reasons for this is because we have mountain lions out here in the west. And if a mule deer buck goes into a real thick area in beds where he cannot see around, he's going to be a very likely victim of a, of a mountain lion. Because a mountain lion can sneak in, they can use the cover, they get in close to the deer, they win the deer or see a movement, and the deer's dead. And the deer, the mule deer can't get up and take off out of there real quick. What a mule deer buck likes to do is he likes to get up into an elevated area, usually on a north facing slope or a real shady area, and they will bed up under the canopy of a like a big ponderosa tree or in some pine trees where they can they can see, they can look out, look down below the understory and they can have all the thermal wind coming up the hill. They'll, they'll bed when the thermals blowing the wind up the hill and they'll lay where they can all the thermals are coming up to them and they can see. And those are the type of areas where mule deer like to bed. If you can find areas where they're bedding, where there are some big beds that have been used multiple times, you'll sight see big droppings, you'll see big tracks, and you know where the watering areas are and their feed areas, then what I like to do is to set my tree stand up at a pinch point, a point where all the activity, all the trails, a lot of the deer activity are coming together from these bedding areas and heading down to the feeding and watering areas. And I like to get back up away from the feed, feeding areas and the watering areas because the deer like to time getting to their feeding and watering areas 
right at dark. And so you're, if you're down here in a, in a big meadow where there's a, a pond and, and they're feeding and the deer are just getting there at dark, you're just getting, out of your, getting to the time where you're getting out of your stand and you can't see anymore and you got the chance or the op you often will spook or bump a buck getting out of your, your stand without knowing about it. And so if you are back up in the woods closer to their bedding area, say a couple hundred yards away from where the bedding area is on a pinch point where you have a good shot selection at a deer coming down the trail and your wind is rolling off the hill away from the deer you have a very good opportunity to take one of these great big mule deer bucks. So I prefer to use, if you're, if you're using bait or you're using mineral, I prefer to have it down in the feeding and the watering area as an additional attraction to get those deer moving into that area, staying in that area, and not trying to hunt over it because they're so unpredictable and they're usually hitting it after dark, just by, by nature. So it's a, they're, those are great tools to get some good photos of the animals in the area, but um, not so much hunting. Now if you get on a piece of private property where all the things can be controlled, um, all the activity in the area can be controlled, hunting over bait or, or mineral might not be a bad idea, but on public land where we're doing all of our hunting and killing our big 200 inch plus bucks, I have had a lot more success with with the blinds and the stands hunting those pinch points that are leading to feed, leading to food and water and that are back into the woods closer to the, the bedding area for the deer and you can get into those areas early in the morning and set up as the deer are coming back so that you're back in the woods you've got some 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 ways that you can get back in there and set up and the deer are moving to you in the morning and then in the evening when they get up they feed around they start moving down to food and water slowly feeding along they come to you while you still have daylight you still have time to make a, a good clean ethical shot and that's what I found with 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 big mule deer bucks with the with the blinds and the stands now my favorite way to hunt mule deer is the spotting and stalking technique. I find this very exciting. It's, it's, it's action-packed. It, it, it takes, still takes a lot of patience with the glassing, a lot of patience during your stalk, but at least you're actively engaged in doing something and to me it's more dynamic. Um, it takes a hunter in a little bit better condition to do spotting and stalking. Most of our spotting and stalking is done in open country, lower desert country. Uh, the temperatures are usually quite a bit warmer during the mule deer, archery mule deer hunt, which starts in mid-August, runs till mid-September. There's less water in most of these areas, and so that's one advantage is we can hunt close to a water source and we know that there's deer in the area because we've already put our cameras out, we've got pictures of the deer and we can get into the areas and we can spot where the deer are moving around and watch them until they bed down and almost almost to a T, almost 100 percent of the time these mule deer bucks are going up to an elevated position with their back to a rock, to a tree, um, to an overhang where they can get into the shade and then the thermals and then they can be up high where the thermal winds, the winds are coming up and bringing the scent from the valley below to them and that's where they feel the most secure. They can watch, they can look for predators uh, and, the, and the wind is coming right to them. And so the Achilles heel for these mule deer is you let these mule deer get in, get settled in, 
and, and start to rest, the thermals are blowing uphill, you circle around, make sure the wind's not going to bring the wind, your scent to the deer, and then you come in from the top and you set up in a spot where when the mule deer gets up, either when the sun hits it and it gets up to move into the shade some more, or when it gets up to stretch or to feed a little bit, you're in position for a shot. And this means getting within, you know, 60 yards or less. But you have to realize that there's a certain amount of of um, risk involved in this type of hunting because the wind is is sometimes fickle and it can circle it can switch directions temporarily it can do a lot of things that can mess up your hunt if you make a sound the mule deer could stand up and look at you and if you're not set up uh, you just spook and, 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 and leave the area but it is a very exciting type of hunting and, and it, it works best if you have a spotter and your hunter and if, if you're being guided, your hunter and your guide and then you have a spotter who is keeping an eye on the deer and giving you hand signals that you can look back and forth through your binoculars, you can, you can have a, a uh, Pre, a prearranged, agreed upon communication technique to let you know by hand signals whether the deer is still there, what he's doing, whether he's laying down, whether he's up, um, and 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 that you can communicate that way. And you've got to be really careful not to make a lot of movement, not to make sounds, and you got to be really patient in your stock. Most times what a mule deer buck will do is it will bed, it will bed down in the, in, the, in the morning, depending on how hot the temperatures are. They'll feed around, they'll feed close to the bed, they'll bedding area, they'll feed around, look around, um, and then they'll finally lay down, sometimes you know up, up to 9 o'clock in the morning, sometimes it's 7 o'clock. It just depends on how warm it is and what the weather's like and a lot of those a lot of different things. But once the deer beds down, you usually have about two or three hours before that deer is going to get up and stretch and move around a little bit. Sometimes they'll lay there for four or five hours. But it seems like that most times during the day a mule deer will get up two or three times and stretch and move around, maybe feed a little bit. And then if the sun hits the deer, the deer rests in a shady spot and as the sun comes around it starts to, to shine on the deer a little bit and he gets warm, he'll get up and move around that tree or a little tuck himself a little further up under that shady rock or whatever he's doing, he's going to seek, he's going to seek some shade. And so you need to be in position so that when he shifts his position you can take advantage and get a shot. Either he steps out, gives you a clear shot, or he starts feeding around and then you you're able to move a little bit and get a shot, but it, you know it's it's a lot of uh, very careful stalking, stalking technique, and and I like to get maybe within a hundred yards of where the deer is bedded, and then I like to take my pack off and my boots and um, load up on water. Make sure your cell phone's turned off. You don't have any kind of anything that can screw screw up your hunt. I mean, if even if you got your cell phone on vibrate in your pocket, I guarantee a mule deer can hear that from 60 yards away. Um, you need to be absolutely quiet once you get within range of a mule deer buck, and you need to set up where you can see where he, he he's usually behind something, and as he steps out to one side or the other, you can get a shot. And it helps to be able to communicate with your, be able to see your spotter, your binoculars, see his hand signals and his communication. The spotter needs to be far enough away that the mule deer doesn't see him. Isn't going to see him, isn't going to spook from 
anything he does isn't going to wind him. Um, you know, this might be a quarter mile away, could even be a half mile away. But you have you, with a good good optics, a good spot and scope, um, you can keep an eye on what the deer is doing. And so, just as with any any other mule deer hunting technique, you need to get out. You need to know where the big bucks are at. You need to put in your time with your cameras and glassing. Find these big bucks. Kind of learn their habits. Learn where they're bedding. Learn where they're feeding. Learn where they're getting their water. And then during the hunt, you can find them, spot them, and stalk them. And I'm going to show some video clips of some of these spotting and stalk hunts. And it's, like I said before, it helps if you're in good shape. You're, you're going to have to do some walking. You're going to be in some steep, rough, warmer type country. You're going to be exposed to the sun. Um, and so, if you're in good shape, you're not laying out there dying in the heat, and uh, you need to be able to, to withstand some hardships when you're spotting and stalking mule deer in this tough desert country type terrain. Now, there are some areas where you can be more in the mountains in some more open country with rolling foothills and pinion, juniper, and ponderosas, and do, and, and do a great job with the spotting and the stalking. Most of the areas where we're, we're hunting our spot and stock type of mule deer is lower in the desert, the, the rim rock, the big rock and the sagebrush, the lower areas with some pinion and juniper that, that rolls back up into the, the rocky hills. And usually the deer will feed low, feed water low, and work their way up high and bed on a slope looking back down their trail. Let's talk a little bit about the equipment for hunting deer. I recommend that people use scent lock and or a, a scent type killer for sure. That you that you're very clean. That you shower every day uh, just before you go hunting. That you use some carbon scent killer. Um, put your clothing in a in a bag with some scent killer. Do everything in your power to get rid of your human scent, to keep yourself clean and odor free, uh, to try to keep from sweating, and then match your camouflage to the terrain. Try to get the camouflage that matches closest to your terrain. If you're going to be going with an outfitter, consult with your outfitter about what camouflage will work best for the area that you're going to be hunting. Um, And uh, the other thing is, is optics. Buy the best optics that you can afford. Uh, you know, the very top of the line, the Zeiss, the Swarovskis, um, the Leica, those are all great brands of, of binoculars. But in recent time, um, the Vortex uh, are very good binoculars and they're much more affordable. And when you're looking at the high end, the top end Vortex, the HDs, they're very comparable to a pair of Swarovskis or a pair of Zeiss binoculars or spot and scope. And they're about half the price or less. And so optics, there's, there's a lot of great optics that are out there, but those are the models and the brands I'd suggest that you stick with. Um, I really, really like the Vortex. I've got the, the HD spot and scope, uh, 20 to 60 by 85 objective, you know, the objective diameter. Very, very good spot and scope. I have a pair of uh, Swarovski 10 by 42 binoculars that I like for mule deer hunting. I know some guys will use a 12 by 50s, uh, and those are a spectacular pair of binoculars too. But I just Personally, I just have a hard time using the the uh, 12 by 50s without getting them on a tripod, without getting down and being very still over a pack or over my knees. And a lot of times when I'm mule deer hunting, I want to be able to put my binoculars up and I want to be able to see 
glass different places as I'm working to my to the spot where I'm going to glass from or as I'm hunting to the stand and so I find the 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 bigger binoculars to be a little more cumbersome and not as effective when I'm trying to stalk and do different things. You know, a, a large person, a, a big tall person, I'm, I'm six foot two, but somebody that's bigger and taller and huskier, to them, the bigger binoculars may be more natural. You know, they're not like little teeny binoculars, but um, I just find the 10 by 40s, 10 by 42s are perfect for me for mule deer hunting and then when I need to really get out and look then I get my spot and scope out and um, and really glass but your equipment your optics um, for backpacks for, for most mule deer hunting a nice mid-size day pack that carries your 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 first aid kit, your water, your lunch, some snacks, your GPS, skinning knife, a rain jacket, a light you know sweater or a uh, hoodie, things like that. Um, if you're sitting in a tree stand, just like with whitetail hunting, you got to be really careful about your activities. And uh, the guys that are paying attention to what's going on, you know, not up there playing video games or texting on the phone or eating, you know, crunch, 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 munch, munch, are gonna gonna do a lot better than the guys that are patiently watching and waiting during that time. And you know, just you're, you're gonna spend three or four hours in the morning and three or four hours in the evening, and, and then you're gonna have most times the midday. You're going to be back in camp and out of the field with your tree stand type of hunting. With the glassing, you're going to be out glassing most of the day, midday. But you're going to be back where you can do different activities and things without disturbing the deer because you're looking long distances away. You can lay down and take a nap. And so each one of these techniques has its its advantages and and. Um, but I would encourage you to match your your physical conditioning and your preference to the type of mule deer hunting that you would like. We're, we're having a lot of success with these big mountain bucks using the stand method and we're having a lot of success with the big desert bucks using a spot and stock method. If you'd like to have a great mule deer hunt you can give us a call and um, schedule a hunt with us. Here in Utah, it's taking about three years to guarantee a tag in these better units. With archery, you can sometimes draw it in two years and even be lucky and draw it in one year. But I like to encourage guys to get on their three, to get up, to get in, to sign up, to get your deposit in, to get into a three-year plan to where you know in three years you're going to you're going to be guaranteed that tag. That way, you can prepare and you can. Um, Get ready for your hunt, get in good physical condition, get ready for your hunt, and you'll know when you're going to draw that tag. And then you can see and get a shot opportunity on that 200-inch buck. Um, Utah's been doing some great management, and we're killing some really nice bucks. This may be your best opportunity of your lifetime right now to kill a 200-inch deer. my friend John the other day and asking him how I could improve my videos here on this wildlife hour and he said I needed to put a little humor into my videos and so I was trying to think of some ways to put humor into my videos and I asked for some suggestions with my wife and I said hey I got an idea honey how about we do what's called the wild wife hour 
<laughs> she said she didn't want to be anywhere near that video camera. I'd have to get somebody else's wild wife. I said, that would be all right. And that's how come she blacked my eye. I'm just kidding. Anyway, I'm back here with the Wildlife Hour and I'm doing some video editing. And these video clips, I figured I'd better outline what some of these clips are before I put these hunts in here to do some demonstrations on what I'm talking about. Anyway, the first, first clip is um, Jason Cleveland on an archery mule deer hunt a few years ago and this is an example of a still hunting style of mule deer hunting and we were able to sneak through the woods locate a group of deer pick out one of the bigger bucks slip into position set up and then Jason was able to make a great shot on a nice little non-typical buck. And so that's going to be the first clip. Uh, the next clip is going to be a video of Laura Franchese's hunt. Um, a lot of people know her as the Martin girl. She used to shoot for Martin bows. And she was also for a time the, a cheerleader for the Buffalo Bills. And she's a Utah girl. And I had the privilege of helping her harvest her first big game animal here in, in her state of Utah. And um, that hunt is an example of a tree stand type of hunt. Um, the weather was very hot and dry. And the deer were in a, a remote area. And they were hitting the water in the daylight and so this is a very deadly tactic if you can find an area that's remote the deer are not bothered and they are hitting the water in the uh, late afternoon a lot of situations on public land you have to get back in the country closer to their bedding areas and set up between water and food and between their their bedding areas to be successful and to catch the deer during shooting hours. So that's an example of a tree stand mule deer hunt. And then in the last video clip, uh, it's the same video, part of the same video I posted a couple days ago about a uh, spot and stock style mule deer hunt in the low desert country. And um, so that'll be the last clip and uh, we'll go from there. I'm Lara and I'm from New York and we're here hunting in Utah, my home state.
All right, there he is. You got him. Good job. Wow. Thank God. <laughs> I tried to stay calm. I was super nervous. But I was able to keep my composure. It was a 36-yard shot, and I knew I could make this shot, so I'm just glad that he went down fast. How far away was that? From here, about 200 yards, but he didn't leave very much blood at all. Because of the angle of the shot, it was we were, uh, steep angle. Twenty-seven feet up in the air, so that was awesome. Okay. Yep. Nice. Very nice. I couldn't believe it. 
They weren't, they didn't come from up in that valley where we thought they were. They came off that far ridge scurrying down. They came down the ridge. Boop. <laughs> I should have waited until he stopped, but I shot him moving. And he must have spun because... Well, when you hit him, he was staggering all the way down that hill. Oh, yeah. He's, I came down here, I, did, like, I didn't see him go out of there and I saw his rack. And I'm like, I'm going to get down now. If you have any thoughts or comments or questions um, please let us know um, you can always like and share and tell your friends about this channel if you like what we're doing or if you have any suggestions um, we've got some products for sale on our website we're selling our logo wear hats um, that's one way you can help us support this channel they're really nice unique logo we also have our headlock taxidermy hangers, which you can't find anywhere else. These hangers uh, allow you to hang your taxidermy mount on the wall and, and put a padlock on them so they can't be stolen, they can't be taken off the wall. And even if you choose not to put a padlock on them, this is a superior mounting system to anything out there. This, when a Shoulder mount is mounted with a headlock. It cannot fall off the wall. You can't bump it and knock it off. You can't do anything to fall off. Hi, Chip. You gonna come join us? Huh? You gonna come join us? Can you say hi? Oh, okay. Alrighty, oh boy. Alright, Chip had to come say hi. He was getting bored in the other room, huh? But anyway, like us and share. Tell your friends about this site if you have any suggestions, any topics you would like us to cover. We're going to be talking about elk hunting next, so stay tuned for that in the next few days. Take care, have a great day.